and welcome to That School Speaks. Today is Tuesday, April 19th, and this is episode 170. What? 170 times, people. 170. Add in at least like 5% of those that I've had to re-record because I like didn't push a button right or technology. I have a very strong EM field that I am in, <laughs> which sometimes messes technology up. I mean, that's a lot of episodes. Hi, how are you? Okay, so this week's episode may be longer than is at all reasonable. What I will try to do, what I have every intention of doing, is offering timestamps. Maybe I'll put them over here or over here. That was the same side of things or over here, or maybe I'll just put them in all the places that I can think of, but mostly at thefastscroll.com, so that if you don't want, want to watch an hour of my face babbling, because you're sane, um, then you can just parcel me out in chunky chunk chunk. Right. Because there's been a lot going on these two weeks. Spring is happening. It's all springy up in here. Not just with like the growing of life and sunshine, but also of all the things. Sorry, I have something in my eyeball. Okay, so at this point, what I think this week's episode will contain are the following segments. I think I'm actually gonna do, okay, so there'll be administrati, that's taken from the Stock Night Zombies. There will be knitting, and I think I will actually do the knitting before the shenanigans this time. I know it's crazy talk, but there may be an excessive amount of shenanigating. Negating. Not negating, but positiving. Shapositiving? That's not a word, though. Because there was a fiber festival and there's the gardening things happening. It's madness. So I think I'll do the knitting and then I will talk about um, some shameless self promotion. So really, that doesn't sound like a lot, but I am me. Oh, and part of the shenanigating will be. Um, so I will say some things I bought at the Fiber Festival because they're fun. Next week, I will offer a review. Um, Chowgu has just introduced, what are they, I think they call it the mini interchangeable needle set. Um, and it is sizes triple zero up through US one and a half, which is like what, 1.75 or 2.5 millimeter. So 1.5 millimeter through 2.5 millimeter. Um, so next week I will offer a review of that. Um, in short, but I will offer it a more in-depth review next time. But it's also FYI. Um, so I hope that I remember to do that next time. <laughs> I think I will. Um, so let's just get right into it, okay? Okay. A bit of strawberry. Doesn't usually have its own sound bite, but you know, whatever. I'm fancy it up for you. Um, so let's say them things. Okay, so one thing I want. I'm already knocking things over. It's, it's chaos in here. It's bedroom. One thing I want to say is like an oops. Um, the beautiful Jean sent me this super awesome apple fabric. But Jean, I'm so sorry. Somehow, like your your envelope with your like human address on it, and your wrap name was not on the information, and I it got separated somehow, and I can't find it. I'm blaming my family, but really it was probably me. But so thank you. I can't send you a thank you because I lost things. But thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then an administrativeness. The next thing to talk about is a new thing that I'm going to start trying. I'm a little nervous about it. I'm not going to lie to you. I think what I'm going to do is start encouraging micro donations to the podcast. What is a micro donation? It's a tiny donation. It's a donation of one dollar. Okay, sorry about that break in the podcast. My dogs discovered that the mailman was near our house and so I had to lose their minds. Anyway, so 
what I'm going to do to try to encourage micro donations to the podcast is that I'm going to offer a prize every other month for any donations of one dollar that are made within those two months. So for example, this time around, donations made in April and May in the amount of one dollar or more, but just one dollar, one dollar, will win you this hand spun. This is hand spun that I spun from Batlings from a Hobbledy Hoy, and they're very fancy Batlings. They were super fine, super wash merino and silk in her speculative fiction color way. It's 6.6 .6 ounces and 756 yards. So it's, you know, fingering sport-ish, somewhere in that neighborhood. I would say fingering. And it's very super gorgeous because of course Hobbledy Hoy she sends magic into all the things she make. And then I added extra magic. So basically it's a lot of magic in there. So you can win that if you donate $1 to the podcast. How do I donate this dollar, you ask? There's a nifty little thing on the fatsquirrel.com. If you're looking on a computer computer, it's on the right hand side and it says, benevolent benefactors donate here. And there's like a little yellow PayPal button that says donate. If you're looking on a small device, then you scroll down to the bottom of the fatscroll.com and you'll see the little yellow button that says donate. One dollar. <laughs> so as you can tell, I feel slightly awkward about this, but I think it's a great way to keep the podcast commercial free as much as I can. I know those of you who watch on YouTube, you're getting a commercial, but I can't control YouTube. <laughs> They're beyond my control. Uh, but to keep this end commercial free, it's a great way to do that. And I would really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, that will be April and May, the first podcast in June. I will announce the winner. And that's what that'll be. So we'll see how it goes this time. I would like to continue to do it in the future and offer either surprises of hand spun or Ultimately, what I'd also like to do is do sometimes like a product that's really nice. Uh, but of course, then I have to uh, I have to contact designers and things and verify that it's okay um, to do that. But we'll see how it goes. Gotta try some things, right? Right. So that's it for that. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is knitting. What? I don't have any spinning. But we'll talk about knitting. So I have a finished object. And it's pretty pretty. I finished my shard. What? Yar. So this is the shard. This is by, and I apologize, I, I believe it's Romy Hill, but it's R-O-M-I Hill. And this is knit with another crafty girl in her strong sock in the vast colorway. Haha, <laughs> I got it. And this is two skeins. The pattern is originally written only for one, uh, but I, ha I wanted a bigger shawl because I am a bigger human. And I don't do well with just like the kerchief thing. Like I just, I feel like it's always like I'm touching it all the time, I try to keep it. And I, uh, so I wanted a bigger piece. And also this yarn is gorgeous and I wanted all of it and I still want more because it's beautiful. Did I say that was another crafty girl and that Sarah's a genius? That's what I should have said. So this pattern was a super fun knit. Um, as you can see, it's stockinette and they're just interspersed with these, no, it's garter stitch. <laughs> interspersed with these stockinette little Eyes of Sauron, right? And it involves short row shaping. Um, but the fun thing about it is no matter um, what size you decide to do, your cast on number of stitches is always the number of stitches you're working on. So for example, there's never like that 800 stitch like final row where you're like, I want Right? So you're always working the same number of stitches, which is awesome. You just have some stitches that are that are live, but you're not working on them. Um, so that's very awesome. And the little shard things, of course, make it 
break it up even further because you're like, oh, I just gotta get to the next one. And then you get one and you're like, ooh, just, maybe just one more. Just, ooh, one more. So now I did do things a little differently and I need to add an errata from last podcast if you watched. Um, I had mentioned that the um, pattern says that your shard color should be, I think, 12 inches. And then the next number is like, I don't know, 42, I think, maybe. But anyway, I got max, I got messed up, messed up, messed up when I originally was looking at those numbers. Didn't realize that that larger number was including the smaller number. So I thought my yarn had too many shards. Like it had too much shardery. So I decided based on that and the fact that when I worked the wrong side shards, I didn't really like the way they looked as much. Now, let me also just say that that is at this level. At this level, you cannot tell the difference. <laughs> so it's only when you're working on it that you can even tell the difference, okay? So there was that factor that I was wrong because I was completely wrong. And this this is exactly the, the um, amount of shardery that is required by the pattern. I almost said the wrong word. Um, so I was wrong. Okay, that was one reason that I did it the wrong, the other way. The second reason was that oh, I was not in love with the way the wrong side of shards looked, but again, only from up here, not from over here. The third was that I'm impatient and I knew that all those shards would take a lot of time. Um, fifth reason. Um, I wanted my shawl to be as large as possible. And of course the shards eat up yarn, of course. I think those are all the reasons that I decided to only do my shards in the right side rows. That was a lot of reasons. And you, I didn't do the right thing where I told you the, the main point before I did the tendrils. So I apologize, that was probably very confusing. But that was all to say that I did them only on the right side, whereas in the pattern you do them on the right and wrong sides, so you get more shards. So not only do you get more shards as the pattern is written, but you get a higher contrast between the shards and the garter stitch coloring of the shawl. So you can of course see on project pages the, the as written way to do things. And you get a much, again, you get higher contrast so as you can see, there's lots of orange in my garter stitch sections. Whereas if I had done the pattern exactly as written, it would be um, much more like it looks right like through here where there's a higher contrast. See, you can see over towards the edges and things that, yeah, there's more orange, but I like the way it looked a lot. I won't lie, I had a crisis of faith halfway through that um, I should definitely rip it all the way back and do it exactly as written. I may have even had a nightmare about it. <laughs> but I am very glad that I did not do so because I am very pleased with how it turned out. I like both the size of it, I like the shape of it, and all of those things. What else did I do differently? Okay, so I used two skeins when the pattern, of course, only calls for one. Um, because of that, I increased the number of um, like short row segments so the original pattern has nine segments. No. Has 11, no. Has 10 segments? I did four more. <laughs> I don't know if I remember how many But I did four more. So I cast on more stitches. That of course made these triangles fatter um, because you work fewer rows, so it made it deeper and both deeper and wider. Okay, okay. Oh, the only other thing I did is I the bind off. Um, is is that the Russian? Is it Russian bind off where you knit, essentially knit two, slide them back, knit through the back loop, knit one, slide those two, knit through the back. I think that's called the Russian. Anyway, it's written with a very stretchy bind off. I did the bind off, and I didn't. It was too stretchy for me. Um, it really like, I think because of the, A, it's with the garter and then also with the, the, um, the shards in there, it kind of gives it a more amorphous look. And so then with the edging also being very stretchy, it was like, it was way too jellyfishy for me. That's just me and how I knit. Um, so I just took that back and just did 
a regular but loose bind off. And I'm very pleased with how it turned out. Um, blocking wise, I did not do it. I did not block it. I washed, I soaked it in my, um, tuft woolen soap. See, I thought before I said it. I soaked it in my tuft woolen soap and then I just put it around. I have like a gold wing dryer, like the, the drying rack. And so I just pinned it or, or with clips. What are those things called? Clothes pins. I just close pinned the top edge around the gold wing dryer and then just let it hang to dry. So I did not, I did not stretch it out very much because again, garter, I like garter for its squishiness. But the but blocking it any bit does make the shard stand out more. So I do recommend some sort of blocking, and maybe if you blocked it even harder, I don't know. But I like it exactly how it is. I had a salad for lunch. I'm very oniony, but luckily you can't tell. So I love how it turns out. Feels very dragon wingy. Again, a very I have Sauroni. Those are all the things I need to say. <sighs> There's a lot of things I said, but I think that was all of them. Okay. Okay, knitting works in progress. Okay. Oh, poo foodle doodle. Um, the next thing I have to show you is the salmon shawl. I just cast this on. Well, I didn't just cast this on. <laughs> but this, I just this between these two weeks. The Salmon Shawl by Stephen West. Um, I don't know if you remember that one. It's an asymmetrical shawl where you're um, holding yarn double. It's written for both fingering and lace weights. I said off foot or whatever ridiculous thing I said because I left my color tags over there. But here is mine so far. <laughs> there's, there's ends and strands and things. So I am knitting mine with Knit Picks. Is it Alpaca Cloud is their lace weight, I believe. And I will, um, I will attempt to remember to put the colorways in the show notes. I will attempt to remember to put the colorways in the show notes. Um, so, but here are the colorways. It's this crazy sky blue and a very olivey green, and a very yellowy yellow, and then a charcoal and a lighter gray. I'm, I don't know, this is totally not my normal colorway, but I felt like I needed something with sky blue and olive in it. I'm obsessed with like acidic -y green, all this, like, ever since that stinking little pierogi, that stinking wool pierogi wore her salmon to the 2015 knitting pipeline retreat and it had this acid green stripe in it. Ever since then, not only have I wanted the salmon with the acid green stripe, but I just want that acid green in everything. It's like my Edison bulb if I were Stephen West. But anyway, so here it is so far. I'm very pleased with it, even though it is totally outside my normal comfort range. But I think it's going to be awesome. I'm knitting it on US 3s, I think. Yes, US 3s, 3.25 millimeters. Uh, but I'm a wonky, loose fit type. Words, words. I'm a wonky, loose knitter. So the gauge is actually suggested for fingering weight at six inches to the inch. I'm only at like four. So I will run out of yarn before this pattern is over, but I'm okay with because I like the fabric. I wanted it to be very open. The last one I knit, I knit with fingering weight and they were fingering weight sock yarns and they were tightly plied sock yarns and it just did not have the drape I think that this shawl really benefits from. So that's why I decided to go A with fingering and well, I didn't A with lace weight. B, the alpaca will also be drapier and an op a more open gauge, so. Did I say that right at all? I wanted to go with lace weight so it would be lighter weight and a more open gauge 
I'm okay with it not being a tighter gauge is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so there's that. And then the last thing I have to show you is also new. And it is the croft -hoose. Have you seen the croft yet? Do you need a croft -hoose? I feel like I'm saying nest, never mind. I don't even want to tell you what I think I'm saying because I have to say that thing wrong and then I'll have to make another errata and eat so much crow. I mean, I'm probably already so fat from eating all of the humble pie in the world. Just give me another slice. <laughs> anyway, it's the Croft Hoose Hout and it is offered as a free pattern as part of Shetland Wool Week. You can get the pattern either by going through Ravelry, the link is in there, or you can look up the Shetland Wool Week and you have to give them like your email address, but you can select that you don't want to hear anything from them and they will not send you anything. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stalling very poorly because <laughs> I'm trying to get to the patterns so I can tell you who wrote the pattern. Um, there we go. Shetland Wool Week 2016 pattern. So last year, of course, was the bobble hat, which was very exciting. Um, and was written for Erin Waite, I believe. This week, this year, it's Fingering Weight by Ella Gordon. Whoosh. Ella Gordon. <laughs> the hat looks like this. So as you can see, this little house is little crops. Croft Hoose. And um, I can show you whatever I want from this pattern, I think, because it's free, but but maybe not technically since you have to. But anyway, they give you four alternate colorways, uh, knit with the beautiful Seamus and Smith yarns. If you'd like to knit any of those, the colorways are included, so you can duplicate that exactly. Um, you can either get Jameson and Smith directly from Jameson and Smith, Shetland Wool Brokers or something. Um, and the, really, it's not that the shipping is not that bad to the US and the price is pretty good. So especially if you can go in with a friend or something and split it because hi, you need five colors for this hat. You can make five hats probably, or at least two and a half. I know what do you do with half hat? Make a headband, I don't know. Anyway, that makes it very affordable. Um also schoolhouse yarns. Is that right? Schoolhouse press. Which is whatever. Elizabeth Zimmerman's company, Schoolhouse Yarns, right? They also sell Jameson Smith in the U.S. I'm sure other people do. I'm just, that's what I'm knowing with words and things. So, um, I just am knitting mine with scraps because that's what I do sometimes. Sometimes I buy the entire set of Shetland wool for the Kate Davies sheep hide because uh, I'm crazy and it's like 10 skeins or something. Seven, I don't know. But sometimes I use scraps. <laughs> Here is my Defar. Now the original hat is only written for three repeats, but I have um, a very, I like a slouchier hat and I have a giant head. Um, so I'm adding an extra house repeat. Maybe two, definitely two. I've already started this <laughs> the fifth repeat. I would put this on my head, but I have like a million doodly doos in my hair and it'll just get stuck on them um but so okay so one color the background colors are both the Jameson and Smith um naturals that I purchased through the Kate Davies sheep hide um this one is colorway 2006 this is colorway 2008 I probably will not put these in the show notes because okay okay um my purple is Harrisville designs in the plum Shetland colorway. Is that not a great color? I love it. And then I also had some Knit Picks palette. This one is Lichen, and this one is Verdant Heather. So there are my colorways all together. I was so super jazzed about all these colors together. I forgot that Farrah knitting, it, it doesn't matter how much you like the colorways together. There's just not, there may not have been enough contrast. This middle row, it actually photographs pretty well. 
so the greenhouses there there's not really technically enough contrast in that row at all I should have switched to purple and whatever I still like it <laughs> So I did the like, okay, so one of the things you do when you're doing feral knitting to see if you have enough contrast between your background and your foreground colors is this twist test. And I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, I certainly didn't know it the first time I knitted anything feral. By the way, I think a feral sweater for my uh, vest for my grandfather was like my third ever knitting project. And it was like a full on, um, wrote <laughs> it was from an Alice Starmore book I think it had like 13 colors in it it was bonkers and he still loves it <laughs> I would never knit it again <laughs> Whatever. so I did not know about the twist test then and I just, it still looks good but um there were not enough contrast between some of my colors so what you do is you just twist your two yarns together and then you look at them is there enough contrast? Well, this in the twist test looks like there's enough contrast, but there is enough contrast. It's just not a high contrast. I think when you're doing like a shape, especially like a, again, it's a house and it's slightly abstracted because high it's, it is what it is. Um, so it doesn't read as clearly from a distance, but I still like it. And I really like these colors. So I didn't want to change again. I had crisis of faith. I may have had nightmares, I don't know. No, oh, it's terrible, but again, it's because I have so many, like, clippy things in my hair. Mwomp. You should definitely give me a dollar. <laughs> because I am so professional. Yay, yay. So, um, so I added two more repeats, or I'm adding two more repeats of the houses. Um, I also added an additional, I think it's 20. 22 stitches for a repeat or something like that. I did add those in because I have a giant head and I like my house to be looser. Especially um, if they're a textury wool. So there's that. I forgot how fun it is to do stranded knitting. Like, it is really fun. I could have finished this hat because I was just like on a roll with it. But I was like, oh, no, I gotta get something else done too. But it's very enjoyable. Um, so, of course, the thing about when you do shell, or when I do stranded thinning, is it makes me want to do everything. I'm like, oh, yes, I need to do this and this and this, and then I want to do that, and then I need this one, and I just go crazy. So that's right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's all the knitting and wooly things. That's not all the woolly things. It's all the knitting. The next thing is going to be shenanigans. So this two weeks, I totally forgot to mention it all together last time. Because I was excited about it, but I just forgot. Um, Indiana has the fiber event every April. And it's in Greencastle, Indiana, which is about an hour west of me. So I went to that. It was very fun. I got to see some of your faces. And I took a class. I should take off first. I took a class on lichen dyeing. I tried to take it last year, but it was already full. And um, what was her name? Remember, Kathy Sparks. So she gave us this very, like, all these, like, nice handouts. But the coolest thing is, is she gave us this. Yuck. It's like the oak tag paper. But... It has lichen samples in it, people. Right. So we talked a little bit about identifying lichens and how to do so and like what the different types were. And then we talked about how India doesn't have the best lichens for dyeing. It's Indiana. It's cheap to live here. Apparently New Zealand. Iceland? No, she didn't say Iceland specifically. New Zealand and polar regions and the Pacific Northwest and like BC and stuff. You guys all have the best lichen. So if you live there, you might want to look into it. Um, oh, so we talked about like, and one of the cool things about lichens, well, there's many cool things about lichens, but in terms of relating them to dyeing yarns, is you don't have to use a mordant. So you don't have to use an acid to make the um, color adhere to the wool. So 
So, right? How cool is that? Um, they have their own stuff in them. So we did the, we did a sample. So basically, all you have to do is like make a tea of these things, and then put your yarn in them. Now, some of them she actually ferments, like the mauvey colored one was like a ferment that she's had running for like three years with these lichens. How much do you want to go to her like garage or whatever? It's gonna look like a witch's house, right? There's gonna be eyes of newt everywhere. Lichens steeping for years. So we got to make these cool little sample cards and we got to make yarn from each of the things. Now, some of them you can see now these were only with a one hour steep. So, you know, I'm sure you could get a darker color. Um, but look, these are the fancy ones that she's in love with, is these purples. This is Umbilicaria. This is Usnia. Different types of lichens. This is the three year ferment. If we'd have let it sit longer, it would have gotten darker. But, so then this is Sticta. Sticta and Lotharia. And then, well, there, I didn't show you that color. It's a nice brown. But then these are the two lichens that we have in Indiana. And as you can see, this one is kind of sad. But look, this one's a pretty brown. It's like a very orangey brown. And again, I'm sure if you let it steep longer, it'll be even more cool. But it's just fun. She was like talking about the lichens that grow. Like some lichens are prone to growing on stone. And there's this ones that are very goldish colored, goldy orange that grow lots of times on tombstones. And they're amazing apparently to dye things with. Um, but one of the bad things about lichen dyeing is it's a one-to-one -one ratio, like weight of lichens to weight of yarn. So if you want to dye a pound of fiber, you need a pound of lichens. And as you can imagine, a pound of lichen is a lot of lichen. Like a lot. So she also went over the basics of like being careful when you gather things that you don't take the whole colony because lichens are very slow growing. Up. To be honest, am I ever really going to go search out lichens maybe not i think i will look for that one though that's the gray lichen that gives you that nice brown because that's near me and like it's feasible to do that but it was just fun to learn about so fun and like we got a bibliography that included crazy old book names which is very exciting like malia pointed one out to me here we go this is um, a reference from a book called On Dead... Oh no, it's a reference to where they found the lichen. On a dead log along a road to Hovey Lake, Mount Vernon, Posey County. Colonel Clark Netkemper, May 11th, 1935. What? So that... <laughs> those things enough are enough to make me be like, yes, that was worth the price of admission right there. So, and also... And then also we got to see her giant, like she had those um, big metal rings that like clasp like you get for like binder rings, except they're like this big. And she had a babillion samples on them. And so, and I'm not even lying when I say babillion, like literally a babillion. And they all had their tag on them because she is a, she's a biologist by trade um, and by training, I guess is actually the right word. <laughs> um, Every single sample had a little oak tag tag on it, and most of them were typewritten. I was so excited. I would have paid like $3 just to look at those. More than that, because that was so exciting. Like you could have had like a sideshow, and you could have had the barker out there like, we've got typewritten tags on oak tag. And I'd be like, yes, I'll pay the ticket price for that. That was my class. It was super good and fun. And again, just something totally out there and interesting. Okay. So speaking of Jameson and Smith about an hour ago, <laughs> so one of the vendors at the actually did have some Jameson and Smith and I was lucky enough. These colors are not planning on putting them together, but I needed like a few accent colors. But the thing I didn't realize until later was these are actually the heritage ones. They, the Shetland heritage, which is like a different product than their normal two ply jumper. And they, if you have an issue with Jetland, Jetland, jeez Louise, 
I'm interested in Jamin, an, inter an issue with Jamison Smith feeling a little scratchy. I mean, I don't, don't know what I, I don't know. But if they are softer, like to me, noticeably softer. Um, so of course they're they're traditional colorways, so you don't have as much fun heathering and stuff like that. But they are still very lovely. And again, great. I love this yellow. Right. So I guess I'm talking about what I bought now. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just do yarn because that's what we're doing. Okay, so one of the things I took with me was I had purchased the skein of Lammy Toes. It was very cute. This is her, um, uh, it's an 80-20 Subrush Merino Nylon and it's, the colorway is Changeling. So it's this very fun color. It has like tealy speckles and like, again, that acidy green speckle. And like a huntery green spark. Anyway, I needed a color to match it, so I brought that with me. <clears throat> and I found this from Leading Men Fibers, because Leading Men Fiber Arts was there. What? Joanna Spring was there? We're fancy in Indiana, y'all. Um, so I bought this. This is Leading Men Fiber Arts. This is their BFL fingering weight. So it's actually 150 gram skein. I did not need that much, but that's the one they had in this color. Just, just don't touch. And it's my favorite color ever, so I can choose the rest. Um, this is their colorway Dirty Truce. Their base is Soliloquy, and it's 657 yards. So I thought, bam, perfect. And they had like four different greens, but only this one. This is all I want. <laughs> And then I also purchased from them. I can't, oh, I'm such a fail. These are all the sport weight and that's their callback base. It's 328 yards or hundred grams and hundred percent sprosh merino. I would never put these colors together but they were hanging next together, next together. Oh, really? They were hanging together, and I was like, those have to happen for me. So this is the color I would never pick, but somehow it needs to be the poppy pop color in something. I don't know if it's gonna be a truck and fills or if I'm gonna make something else up. I really feel like I wanna make something else up, but I'm not gonna hold myself to it, I don't know, we'll see. This one is Eternal Kiss. This one is cherry pie. Oh my gosh, pie. <laughs> this one again is the dirty juice. I know, but it's for white. And it's for something else. Legit and stuff. <laughs> so yeah, either. it was so hard not to buy a babillion things from them. <sighs> so there's that. So then I also... <laughs> So these are all the, that's all the yarn I bought. That's not too crazy. I didn't buy any fiber. It's very hard. Joanna had these bats that were like, not quite, they were like the blue, slightly bluer. Oh my God, they were so gorgeous. So, and I, but I've like, I've got two of her bats sitting on my shelves that I need to spin. Must control myself and let other people have the pretty things. But boy, it was hard. So, then another one that I see there every year who I've never purchased anything from is um, Woven Dimensions by Jennifer Berger. And she's in Zion. She's in Zionsville. This is really close to me. So I bought this. I bought Tova a panda. Actually, that's what happened first. But she's already stolen it. Um, which is legit. It was hers. But so then I bought the panda. But then I was like, but I need this moose because... <laughs> Hello. They're all felted. What? <laughs> He's like, my BMI is 40 moose. <laughs> hmm. I went to the doctor and they wrote clinically morb morbidly obese on my diagnosis. Is that about, by the way? That's a diagnosis? Anyway, that happened to me. 
I was so perturbed. Not that I don't know, like, hi, I own mirrors and like eyeballs. Like, I am aware that I am morbidly obese. But like, when you go in for something completely unrelated, like a sinus infection, and they write that on your like, cause now like it's all progressive, right? And it's all like, here's your information from your me from your doctor's appointment or whatever. And like, it's like the diagnosis is like, oh, that's what it was. The diagnosis is like ear in or sinus infection and morbid obesity. What? You needed to diagnose that when I went for my ear infection? Sinus infection, whatever it's called, whatever. Anyway, sorry, that was a rant. Anyway, so I see some cute. <laughs> Your BMI is probably not even 40, Mr. Moose. I don't know, but it was just, you looked so mopey. That's what it was. Mopey Moose. And then also this pig, because I love this pig. <laughs> it has the tiniest little legs and tail in the world. It's very exciting. <laughs> and then the last thing I have to show you before we get on a shameless self promotion is I don't know this these you these people don't have a website or anything so I feel like guilty even showing this to you because you can't have it but at the same time I have to show you this is a little needle felted piece it is Emmy the sheep a felted wool painting and it's totally just like done on a piece of like wool batting. So, or, yeah, it's not even like full on wool felt. So I'm like, I gotta be so careful with it, but is it not amazing? I love it so much. <laughs> Do you feel it? Do you feel it? So anyway, everybody do this now. This is such a cute idea though, to do the the embroidery hoop wool felted painting. Everybody make that. She had a crazy big one that was on burlap and it was Morel's, which I was in love with, but it was very large. It was like this big. Like this I can very easily put on my workspace. This thing was rather giant, but it was so fun too. I wanted to commission this size morels, but that was crazy. This girl is not, she doesn't even have PayPal. She's not set up for that. How fun is that? I don't know if you remember, I bought the Starry Night from her like two years ago or something. Now I have a sheep. Okay, so that's all the stuff I bought. Okay. I think. Yes. So sorry if things look weird. Um, I totally forgot this whole portion of the things that I was going to talk about until I started to, to do the editing and I was like, well, I thought this show would be so long and it's really not that long. Hmm. <laughs> so one other thing I want to talk about in shenanigans is that, um, sorry, I'm slightly distracted. My daughter just got banned from a server, so she's a little upset. So I'm just checking to make sure that there's, okay, anyway. Modern life. <laughs> um, oh, so another thing I want to talk about in shenanigans. And by the way, I feel like I just rushed right through the whole wool event thing, but I just I met beautiful faces. I walked around. I took a fun class. I guess that's really that's all I did. Wool morale. Okay, yeah, that's all I did. Okay. But so gardening, shenanigans. Okay, I'm a terrible gardener. FYI, um, I'm a very new gardener, and the bad thing about, well, the difficult thing about gardening is that it is, a, there's a learning curve like anything else, except like it's a whole year you have to wait between lessons. <laughs> so like this year we started tomato plants at doors. Okay, we actually started tomato, I, we talked about it, right? Just about tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and something else. I think cilantro or something. Anyway. The basil. We started those inside. My tomatoes are so sad. They're so leggy. Apparently I need to be closer to light. I don't know. The sun is so far away. Really? Really tomato seeds? Okay, for one thing, why are you so tiny? 
Of course a plant can't grow from that. It's like the tiniest seed in the universe, except lettuce. But hello, oh, lettuce is just a leaf. And then it's done. But like, tomato seeds, why are you so tiny? And again, the sun is so far away. Why is it that you have to be under the sun? Like, but you're not under the sun in nature. Do we make you that way? Anyway, so my tomato plants are very leggy. But that's okay, because we're going to go buy some tomato plants from the 4-H. Actually, we may not buy them from the 4-H. We may buy them somewhere else. Whatever, I'm going to buy a few tomato plants this year. It's okay. Next year, I'll have my pineapple black tomatoes. Not this year. <laughs> anyway. Um, so that was... And the, oh... So then to add to me being like so stressed out about how leggy my tomato plants are. Dude, I really am resenting them. <laughs> That's probably why they're so leggy. They're not striving for light, they're striving for love because I'm not giving them enough. They've disappointed me. <laughs> so then also Annie knocked the, the flat over. So that, sorry for the pause again. There's light outside and the dogs see more shadows. I don't know what's going on. Anyway. So, so then there was like the massacre of the leggy tomato plants and I was both like really upset about it but also like I had been freed from the burden of trying to save them. <laughs> I may be premenstrual. I don't know. <laughs> So the rough thing about gardening is like, and now I'm like, well now I gotta wait a whole other year. And will I remember this lesson next year? Hopefully. I mean, I'm sure I will because it is deeply ingrained. Sorrow I will carry with me for at least a year. Yes, of course I can start another run, but there would be no, oh, okay, there would be a point. But you just, it's dead to me now. <laughs> but I think my other seedlings are okay. I think it's just those persnickety tomatoes. But anyway, um, oh, but so in continuing gardening saga, last year I bought um, what were called smart pots and then like another off brand, but basically they're grow pots. Like you can find reviews of them at like 420.com, <laughs> but also organicgardening.com. So they have a variety of uses and you can be on all sorts of exciting lists. Um, but especially when you're also buying indoor lighting for them, but whatever. So I also, so last year I bought grow pots and last year they worked really well because we had a very wet summer, um, like a really wet summer. And so I had tomatoes in my grow pots and they did beautifully because they never got too bogged down with moisture because the grow pot, unlike, um, well, I mean, uh, lots of times ceramic pots, I mean, a ceramic pot is porous, so it can only hold so much water, but the, um, the grow pot is much more air permeable and water permeable, like water will shut off it fast. So in a dry summer, that's not a great thing because you have to really keep them moist. Um, the good thing is, even in a dry summer, technically, because the bag itself is porous, it can still draw water um, from the ground, as long as it's on earth and not like a patio or whatever. It can theoretically still draw moisture from that, but I don't. You know what I mean? Like, it's more challenging, obviously, for the plant to do so. But the grow pots worked really well last year. I'm a little nervous about them this year because, again, I think the reason they worked so well was because of the high rain level we had. But because of our crazy yard, I need to have things that are mobile so they can be moved around for sunlight. And also, like, just because I have no attention span. And I don't want to, like, double dig my entire because his hands are made for knitting. I'm like, I can garden a little bit, but not that much. So the solution is grow pots, because then again, it's like something you just dump dirt in, you don't have to double dig, it's already aerated and like lovely, and it's easy to fertilize, because you know exactly how much dirt's in them, it's, uh, and they're mobile, and all of those things. So. Uh, the only uh, they're and they're really not I mean they're they're much more cost effective than or reasonable or whatever uh, than like buying ceramic pots or something like that and the great thing is is when you're done with them you don't just have like a big pot of dirt over over the winter you just you can either dump the dirt out which is what we did into our other raised beds and then we'll refill them uh, but then they collapse down because they're literally just like cloth bags 
So I read last year that you could make your own using um, landscape fabric. So you know like that black fabric they lay down when they make like a new flower bed or whatever to help keep the weeds from coming up through the garden. Um, that you can make them with those. So I bought the fabric last year, but I gotta be honest, when I bought it, it was so much thinner than I had anticipated. I mean, I knew what that fabric was like, but I was buying like the heavy duty kinds. So I thought maybe it was magically more like the pot because the pots I bought are very much, they almost have like a felt texture to them. And so this is much thinner and you can see, like you could not squish those other ones down like this. Um, so I don't know how durable these are going to be, but I thought I would like to try some. Uh, because obviously a whole roll of that fabric is like eight bucks or something. And I'm pretty sure I could make enough pots to cover my entire yard. <laughs> so I don't know how durable they'll be, but we're going to find out this year. So that's the other thing I did this week is I made some grow pots. I made... The other reason I wanted to make some is because most of them were offered um, in like one, three, five, seven, ten, you know. But they're, most of them are cylindrical. Um, which is great, but like for example, lettuce does not need that much depth to surface area. Um, lettuce plants just need a little bit of depth. So ideally what I would like to have for the expenditure of dirt that needs to go into them, because a five gallon um, grow pot will hold like slightly more than half of a big bag of potting soil, garden soil, whatever. Um, and so that's can be, we don't have access to like a truck full of dirt. <laughs> so that can add up. I got my dirt on a really good price, but still it adds up. And so if you can get the dirt to be shallower for things like lettuce or herbs, a lot of herbs don't need a lot of depth, I think, but I don't, I don't know anything. Don't trust me. But so what I wanted to do is make some rectangular ones for my lettuces. So I made this guy. So this, what I did for this one, because it was a bigger pot, I did make it a double thickness and I just kind of like basted the, the layers together. You probably can't tell, but like, just like really not measuring anything, <laughs> not just eyeballing it. I just quilted them like that far apart, just again to keep them together so they wouldn't slide around. Um, and then I just, boxed in corners like you would if you were making a bag or something or any other craft project and so these are very like you can see that they're not really rigid but you don't need them to be I mean yes it would look lovely if they were all like perfectly stand up squarey um so when you put the dirt in them it doesn't perfectly stand up like this it kind of goes well it goes the other way it slightly goes but you can kind of so I put my lettuce in two of those and one of these, for this much more surface area, is a, takes about the same amount as a five gallon one, um, which only has like this much surface area. So you get a lot more area to grow your lettuces in for the same amount of dirt. Does that make sense? Again, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> so I made that one and then I was experimenting because I thought, and I'm sure that they come in like a standard width. So for this one, what I did was the given width, I think it's like 38 or something like that, if I'm not thinking. This I just made 25 inches long, and then I made them six inches deep. So the, the actual bottom area is more like what? Um, 38 minus 12, so 26 by 13-ish is like the bottom surface. So then the other one I did is I thought, oh, let's try to make just some round pots and see how those go. So this one I made 15 inches wide with a four inch corner. And this one I just sewed up on the edges. Like again, like you're making, um, like Craftsy has a course on how to make a drawstring bag. And it's a free course. Um, basically the same principle except like minus almost all the steps. <laughs> just sew up the sides and make corners in the bottom. To make corners in the bottom and then on this one I did turn the again I just used the standard 
width of the fabric, but I just folded it down because that was way too tall for the size of pot this was. So this one is 15 inches wide and with four inch corners. And I think this is like, again, just eyeballing it, I would say this is maybe like a three gallon pot. No, it's more like a two gallon pot. But this would be good so sorry. for herbs or anything like that because again, you don't need as much depth or a small pepper plant. Maybe not like a bell pepper, but like, like a spicy pepper. They don't need as much space. So then I was again trying to find like the five gallon size. So I tried 20 inches wide. Again, the standard height of the fabric with a six inch corner. And that one I think is a little bit more than five gallons. Like, like it's pretty, like it's, a, it's for your beekeeping costume and your golf with your bees. Um, because you know, beekeepers are so goth. Um, so this one is a little bit too big, so again, just experimentation. But again, if you're trying to grow maybe two small pepper plants or something like that. But this, I think, is what is a basically a five gallon size, which was 18 inches width with a four inch, no, a six inch corner. And that, I think, is about a five gallon size. So I'm going to try them out this year. See, it's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit like the bees could get in there. Not like the other one where it covers you know better. Um, so again, we'll see how, could you see how you could see through it when I did that, right? No, you can't. But you can still see through this fabric. <laughs> so we'll see how um, durable they are when you make them this way. Uh, again, the other ones I bought last year and they look just like they, I mean, they're dirtier, but they don't seem to be any worse for wear. Um, over one season of use. I don't think these are anywhere near as durable, but boy howdy, they're super cheap. <laughs> Again, a whole roll of that fabric, I think was $10, and you literally could make, I mean, you could make like a hundred of these, I think. Um, just again, your time obviously. Uh, I did, I tried to use like a super strong nylon coated thread, but my machine did not like it. So I ended up just using a polyester thread. That may be another factor on how durable they are. I did double all the seams um, just to help. We'll see how it goes. And I'll let you know. Um, the other thing is on all of these, I don't, I think I said it on the first one, but on all of them, I did fold down some height. Um, not only because they were too tall otherwise, but again, I thought it would just give it a little extra strength uh, so it would be less likely to split or tear at this top part. I don't know, is that helpful to anybody? <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I'm kind of excited. Again, I have two lettuce beds planted with these and um, I had bad luck. I, I Tomatoes did great in this, in the uh, five gallon pots last year. I also tried to print, plant some winter squash and while the plants themselves looked pretty good, I, d I had no joy. There's no luck on getting any great winter squashes out of them. But I think that was not actually due to the pot. Well, I know it wasn't due to the pot. It was due to the fact that they had some sort of mildew or something on them that I did not realize until, again, yeah, one shot out of a year. Whew, it's so stressful. I mean, Jiminy Cricket. But anyway, <laughs> so I just thought I would show that I get, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Um, basically, I'm just experimenting. I'm not like saying, yay, this is definitely the way to do things or not the way to do things. But sometimes it's good just to see other people experimenting and to get ideas of what you could do better or what would work better for you. Um, but again, if you go in on a roll of that with somebody else or like five other somebody else's. <laughs> watch the free craftsy class on how to box a corner and sew a side seam like that's again that's the drawstring bag is a free it's uh it's i didn't say etsy i meant craftsy um so th that's a basic skill and you can obviously also get that just like by googling it um but yeah i mean it took maybe well i don't know how long it took because i did it over a day like making them and checking them and um but we'll see how they go um, so the last thing to talk about is shameless self-promotion. And it's self-promoting. There'll be, uh, there will be a shop update 
on April 22nd. That's a Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And yeah, okay, here it goes. So there'll be these exciting owls ah, in sock size. <sighs> Favorite green in the world. There's a totally a green theme to this week's episode. It's like the Grinch post he returned Christmas. It's exciting Grinch colors. So there's this, which is the um, small wedge. And this is just a, this one has, sorry. This one has a super fun, like, weedy lining. <laughs> like, hi, they're like, just knit a peaceful sock, lady. Knit a peaceful sock. The rest of them have just the unbleached lining. Right. Like, art deco spring flowers. And the next one is one of my favorite hydrangeas. I love the green hydrangeas so much. Right. It's almost hydrangea time, people. And then the last one is a different size than I normally do. Um, and it was just dictated by the size of this print. It is basically an inverse Aran bag. So my Aran bag is usually the size. And but I just inverted it. Because hi, Mr. Stag with birds and his horns and a giant lotus eagle and a flower in the middle of him. What are you talking about? So in order to get the exciting, all of the excitingness, I had to make it a weird size, but it's a good size. Again, it's humongous. <laughs> there we go. It's that big. And it's that big. And it's this big. Right there. So it's pretty exciting. So those will again will all be available in update April 22nd. Oh, and the reason I did this on the bottom was because again with the white, I thought maybe it would be better to have a little darker bottom to protect from the grubbies. So hydrangeas are deco green flowers. Super cool owls. Shut up. But don't. Okay, I think that's everything. I'll talk next week.